And the more that I've studied, the more excited I've become. And, and, and as, as we've gone into, into this, I've had to do quite a bit of study into the human foot and the steps we take and such. And, and I learned a lot. I think there's some interesting facts I would love to share with you guys about feet this morning. I know that sounds weird, but, uh, but according to the American Podiatric Medical Association, a person takes between 8,000 and 10,000 steps a day. Now, I know that we all have those fancy watches that count our number of steps. You're like, Jimmy, I don't, I don't step that many times in a day. But in America, it's around 6,900. But in Sweden and Australia, it's over 9,000 steps a day. So this, this average 8,000 steps in, a, in an average lifetime will span 115,000 miles, four times the circumference of the globe. I think that was interesting. I, I learned that the foot is an intri intricate structure that has 33 joints, 107 ligaments, 19 muscles, and tendons, and, and they hold that structure together that allow us to move in a variety of ways. I learned that the amount of pressure that our foot puts down for each footstep equals that of some trunks and some other things. This is incredible. I learned that there's 52 bones in our feet, and these 52 bones make up a fourth of all the bones in our body. I learned some other facts. I learned that, that uh, two, rarely on people are two feet ever the same size. I also learned that our, our feet swell and they grow during the day, and our feet are bigger at night. So ladies, when you go shoe shopping, don't go in the morning, because then when you go to look pretty in your dresses for your evening attire, your shoes aren't going to fit as well in the evening. So go shoe shopping at night, all right? That was free. Uh, the average person walks at a, at a walking pace of 3.1 miles per hour. That is, unless you're walking to the beat of Taylor Swift's Shake It Off. If you're walking to that beat, the person will walk at a 5 mile per hour mile pace. So if you want to get your sweat on, you want to get your, your walking on, <laughs> listen to Taylor Swift. I also learned that it, to burn off one plain piece of M&M &M candy, just a regular plain piece of M&M, &M, one M&M, &M, you'd have to walk at that 3.1 mile per hour pace. You'd have to walk the length of a football game. For one M&M. &M. <laughs> and then I learned that to burn off one Big Mac, not the fries, not the Coke, one Big Mac, is 48 minutes of walking time at that pace for one Big Mac. So I hope your Big Mac attack was worth it. Have you had your break today? No, not if you're eating a Big Mac. You have <laughs> There's a ton of more facts about feet that I wanted to share. I learned that the favorite chips of feet are Doritos. <laughs> but they will make do with Cheetos. <laughs> I also learned that if you injured your feet in the middle of the road, you would have to call a tow truck. <laughs> I know, I know. And, and, and lastly, I did learn that feet do not get along well because they both can't be right. <laughs> All right, I've taken you through the agony of the feet for long enough. I think we can, I think we can dive into the message this morning. Uh, there's some things that come to mind when we talk about our footprints, right? Our footprints show where we have been. Our footprints show the directions we have gone. They show our past. They show steps we have taken to where we are now at this point in time. And sometimes our footprints get washed away. Sometimes they get covered up with debris, leaves, dirt, what have you. Sometimes they just disappear over time. But they always tell a story. They, they always tell a story about where we've gone, where we've been, what we've gone through to get to the journey that we're on now. And there are many times in Scripture we can learn from the steps others have walked before us. Now, life lessons, sad stories, exciting tales are all told by where the feet have gone first. And as we look into scripture this morning, as we talk about the stories our footsteps tell, I want to talk about obedience to God. This morning, I want us to examine the word of God and look at footsteps of obedience and what that means for us. Now, if you would turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 22, and as you're turning there, I'll give you a, a seven-second rundown of Genesis 15 through Genesis 22. Uh, Abram and his wife Sarah prayed for a son. God met with Abraham at, a, at 100 years old. They was given a son who was named Isaac, his only son. God entered into a covenant with Abraham and his descent, and, 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 and God told Abraham that his descendants would be more numerous than the stars. And now without being here all morning, we're sort of caught up. <laughs> <laughs> so on to Genesis 22. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 18 this morning, and, uh, and, it, and it goes like this. After these things, 
God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, here I am, he answered. Take your son, he said, your only son Isaac, whom you love. Go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering as one of the mountains I will tell you about. So Abraham got up early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took with him two of his young men and his son Isaac. He split wood for a burnt offering and set out to go to the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there to worship. Then we'll come back to you. Abraham took the word for the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. In his hand he took the fire and the knife, and the two of them walked on together. Then Isaac spoke to his father Abraham and said, My father, and he replied, Here I am, my son. Isaac said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Then the two of them walked on together. When they arrived at the place that God had told him about, Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood. He bound his son Isaac and placed him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He replied, Here I am. Then he said, Do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your only son from me. Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in the thicket by its thorns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it as a burnt sacrifice in place of his son. And Abraham named the place the Lord will provide, Jehovah Jireh. So today it is said it will be provided on the Lord's mountain. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn this is the Lord's declaration. Because you have done this thing and have not withheld your only son, I will indeed bless you and make your offspring as numerous as the stars of the sky and the sand of the seashore. Your offspring will possess the city gates of their enemies, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed by your offspring because you have obeyed my commands. But as we dive into these verses, there's a lot I want to point out. In verse 1, it says, God tested Abraham. It's important that we understand that this was not a temptation of God. To follow, or I mean, temptation of Abraham by God. It was a test of Abraham's heart. There's a difference. So it's important that we look and understand that. And then when we slide into verse 2, it says, says, Take your son and offer. These are startling commands, which activated a special testing for Abraham to sacrifice his only son. Matter of fact, God says three times in verse 2, verse 12, and verse 16, he, he emphasized only son, Isaac as Abraham's only son. <clears throat> Again, this would mean, this, this, this testing would mean killing his only son, a son who was at that time oh, at least over 20 years old, not the seven-year-old or eight-year-old that we learned about in children's church that, that went willingly. He was an adult male, a grown man. Killing his only son would mean a lot more than just, well, well killing his son. It means the promise God made to Abraham. The promise about his descendants being more numerous than the stars, the Abrahamic covenant. But let me let me pause here for a minute. God had promised Abraham that his descendants would be numerous, that that he would be a great nation, and that this promise would be done through his son, and he would be given an amount of of land. And again, this only son Isaac is the key to all of this happening. God had cut a covenant with that with with Abraham. And what that means is Abraham went and he gathered specific animals that God told him to do. And these animals were cut in half, which is, which is what a covenant, a, to cut a covenant would be in this time. These animals would cut in half, and what would happen is, is two men would walk through the middle of, of these animals, and they would say, I promise to do this. I enter this covenant with you, and if I fail, I should be as if these two animals are. But, but if we remember the story correctly, God had Abraham fall asleep and he passed through the covenant on his own and as a cloud and through other things. So this is a very serious thing. This test, this test would mean the loss of everything. Everything God had promised. This could have seemed like an irrational test of faith. It could have seemed like it was too much. It could have seemed like, God, you just promised me these things just 20 short years ago. 
Yet what Abraham did was obey. Following God's call, following God's instruction could be the end of the life of his only son by his own hand. Or it could mean the destruction of the covenant God made with him. Or it could mean Abraham would fail this test and not be able to carry it out. Maybe today God is telling you to take a, a leap of faith on your own and do something for him. Amen. Maybe God called you to do something years ago, but you ignored it. Maybe God gave you clear instructions, called you to something extremely hard that would cause you to sacrifice everything you had. Maybe it would mean you would have to move and, and leave people behind. Maybe it was a mission trip. Maybe it was a call to preach. Maybe it was a, a friend to chase after and share the gospel message with. Maybe it was something else. What has God put on your heart to do? What has God told you to do this morning? Have you been heeding it? What has he placed on your heart? Have you obeyed like Abraham did? did you, or did you say, no, God, that, that seems like an irrational test of faith. That seems wrong, God. That seems too hard. God, I, I, I can't give that up, God. I can't move from there, God. Or did you say, okay, God. I'm telling you, church, that God calls us to make hard decisions. And, and, and he tells us to draw a line in the sand at some point and to follow him without counting the costs of the worldly costs, without counting the costs of what it would be. May it be our life. And God calls us to do those things. He calls us to be obedient. He calls us to pick up our cross and follow Jesus. And we must heed that calling. We must allow our footsteps to take us towards God in obedience, wherever that may lead us. Now, as we dive back in Scripture, as we as, as we, we dive back in here, we see that God gives us a timetable. And God gives us a three-day timetable of events. Day one is when God gives his test to Abraham. This timetable shows that Abraham acted without delay. He's told on day one to go and offer his son as a sacrifice. Verse three shows us day two, and it says Abraham rose early. He saddled a donkey, cut firewood to prepare, and got on his way. Now, Abraham was in Beersheba at this time, which is one of the hills of Jerusalem. And it was a two-day trip from Beersheba to Moriah. And just a little history here, Moriah is commonly associated with Jerusalem, but it is also the site where Solomon's temple would later be built. So David, if you're watching, there's some history for you. <laughs> Let's look at uh, verse 4 now. On, on the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there to worship, then we'll come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. In his hand, he took the fire and the knife, and the two of them walked on together. This is day three. We have a three-day journey from when God initially tested Abraham to now. Three days of stepping forward, one step at a time, one footstep at a time, one footprint leaving a path behind us, headed forward to the sacrifice of his son. Three days would give Abraham much time to reflect upon what God was telling him to do. Yet... Abraham remained steadfast, unwavering, and unyielding, being obedient to what God says. Friends, all too often God gives us something to do in obedience to him, and it is tough. So we soften that message a little bit. We, we use some of the same language that the serpent used, serpent used in the Garden of Eden. Did God really promise that? Did God really say to do that? And as we, as we soften those commands that God gives us, we take a step from obedience and we begin to waver in our footsteps. Are you sure he meant that? Another footstep as we hesitate. Couldn't, we have, couldn't he have wanted me to do this instead? Another footstep. Maybe, maybe Johnny is more equipped for that than I am. Uh, uh, another footstep. And before you know it, we have changed off of a path God had ordained for us to do something miraculous, something for his glory, something that was meant for us, something that we may only wonder about. And step by step, our footsteps now tell a story of disobedience to what God has put on our heart. They tell, they tell a journey of, 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 a, of a calling unfulfilled. They tell the story of, of hope yet not reached. They tell the story of so many other things than what God had for us. 
We soften his commands. We doubt his strength. We doubt that he is control and we is in control, and we trust our own power instead. We we wait as, we wait until it's convenient for us. Oh no, I've got plans that weekend, God. I'm supposed to go on vacation. I can't start this weekend. I've got to, I, you know, I have vacation days at work. I can take 40 hours. If I go and do that, then I won't get to, uh, God, uh, God, now it's just not a good time. You know, it's a pandemic and, you know, toilet paper was gone for a while. And, and God, we just, now it's just not a good time, God. It's just not convenient. Well, what God really wants us to do is to follow him obediently on the path that he has laid out for us. And that path that leads us closer to him, that path that takes us to new heights, that path that strengthens our relationship with him, the path he has gone before us in, and the footsteps that he has laid for us to rest on. He has laid a path that he has prepared for us, whether we know it or not. And we see in verse 6, Abraham took the, took the wood and he laid it on Isaac. He, he took the knife and he took the fire. The preparations were complete. The preparations for the sacrifice were complete. And Abraham took the preparations and he and Isaac walked away together. I want us to look at Hebrews 11, 17 through 19 for just a second. And it says this, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. He received the promises and yet he was offering his one and only son, the one to whom it had been said, your offspring will be traced through Isaac. He considered God to be able to even raise someone from the dead. Therefore, he received him back, figuratively speaking. Abraham walked up that mountain confidently and assured his servants he would and his son would return. Yes, Abraham was so confident in God that he would keep his promise that he would even raise Isaac from the dead or provide a substitute for him if need be. He had no doubt. Amen. He had no question. This is evident in the timetable provided. There was no hesitation. He rose up early and he left. It's a two-day journey. He got there in two days. This is evident in the assurance that he gave to the two. He left the tent to the donkey. The two of us are coming back here. Amen. And this is evident in the trust that he had in God. Amen. Yet, yet I wonder for me how agonizing that walk would have been. The, the, the three days up there may have been okay. But now we're here and I have the tools. I wonder how long that walk would have been for me. Probably the longest walk of my life. Each step knowing I was walking to sacrifice my son. My only son. Each step agonizing as I walked towards the end of this path. Could I have been as obedient like Abraham was? My, my, my own son. Could I have been as resolute in my trust of God? Could I have been as strong in my faith in him? I hope I could. Amen. See, the thing about obedience really just boils down to trust. See, do we, do we trust God? Amen. Do we really trust God? Like, sure, we trust him. He, yeah, God's, God's got a place for me in heaven. I trust, boom, I trust that. Man, I know that God can do big, great things. We say this morning, God, you do great things. But do we really trust him? See, do we trust him with those finite details of our lives? Right? Do we trust him with the little things? Or, or do we just trust him with the big things that we know we are powerless to affect? God, I can't, I can't fix that, God. Do we take him off the shelf when the going gets tough? God, I've been dead up to my eyeballs. God, I, I need this, I need this. God, God, I can't buy groceries this week. God, fix me, help me get out of debt. And then we get a new job, and we, we, money comes in, and it's tax time, and, 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 and God goes back on the shelf, and we're cruising the ocean in a new boat, and boats, and, uh, and everything is, everything's glory, but God's, God's back on the shelf, right? See, see, we... We forget, we forget that, that we have to trust God with everything all the time, right? All the time, God is good. Amen. And God is good Amen. all the time, right? Amen. And we forget that we have to trust Him with everything. We forget that we have to trust Him with all, all the things. We forget how vast and powerful God is. But in that vast and power, we really forget how much He loves us. We really forget that he knows the number of hairs on our head. He knows our shoe size, even if our feet are a little different. 
circumcises. He knows that. <laughs> Right? He, scripture says that we, we forget that he knows us before we were formed in our mother's womb. He knew us. We forget that God knows everything about us. We forget that God is the God of small things, not just the God of big things. We trust ourselves more than we trust God. We trust us with the daily mistakes we make. We, we trust us with the sinful nature we exhibit. We trust us with our selfish desires. We trust us with our secret sins. We trust us with the messes that we've made of our lives. We trust us with the people that we've hurt. We trust us with the dark places that we've hidden. We trust us with all of that. And in spite of all those things that we've done wrong, that we've messed up, we still would rather trust ourselves than trust the God who created us. Amen. We would still rather trust ourselves than trust the God who created the stars, the God who created the universe, the God who created the planet, and God who created DNA, the God who created everything, every creature, friends, it comes down to trust, and all too often we misplace it. In verse 9 and 10 here, we see how much God trusted in, or Abraham trusted in God. When they arrived at the place God had told them about, Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood. He bound his son Isaac and placed him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out and took the knife to slaughter his son. Abraham trusts God so much, he prepares to kill his only son. He builds the altar. He binds Isaac to it. He arranges the wood. He places his son on top of it. He takes the knife to kill his son. Oh, church, the altar is laid. Isaac is willingly gotten on to it and been bound to it. Isaac, Abraham's only son, the son, the heir to the nation that Abraham would start from, the baby promised to, by God to him and Sarah, the, the seed to their promise from God, their covenant. Abraham picks up the knife that he has used in sacrifices and he raises it. See, church, do you trust him this morning? Do you really trust him? Do you trust him with your family's life? Do you trust him with your children's lives? Do you trust him with your life? Or are you still waiting for something else to put your trust in? See, what else or who else could possibly be more trustworthy? Nothing. The answer is nothing. And there never will be anything else, anyone else, more trustworthy than God. There just won't be. Amen. There will not be anything else or anyone else more loving than God. There just won't be. There, there will never be anything else more graceful than God, more powerful than God, more than anything than God, and there never will be. Amen. Amen. We just have to open our eyes and receive that today. We just have to open our eyes and, 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 and we have to know that. We have to open our eyes and we have to trust that. We have to receive that. We have to trust that. We sing worship songs all day long. We sing songs like like, Lord, there's nothing greater than you. Lord, there's nothing greater than you. Lord, there's nothing. Nothing is greater than you. Amen. We sing it. Is it just words on the screen? No. Or do you believe that? We live it. Do you receive that? See, there's a saying around the, the world that says, church members don't lie. They don't tell lies. They just sing them. <laughs> <laughs> Do we know? Do we believe? Are we, are we, when we sing worship songs to God about how great God is like we did this morning and how wonderful God is and how, how amazing God is, we're singing those to God. They're just not words. They're truths. Amen. Amen. So you either believe that there is nothing greater or there is not. And if those words are real to you, then amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And, and, and if you mean it, that means then we have to walk the walk. We have to put our footsteps on the path that God has put us on. Right. And we have to walk the walk. See, talking the talk is just lies to ourselves. Talking the talk it, 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 to others, for, for what reason? We talk the talk, what, to make us feel better? We talk the talk so that we can seem better? We talk the talk so we can put on a facade of faithfulness? We, we of a false representation of holiness that benefits whom? Not me, not you, not the person you're putting that facade on for. None. Talking the talk walks you right through the gates of a fiery hell. Right. 
But oh, walking the walk. Those footsteps. Those footsteps take you to another place altogether. They set you on a path altogether. The destination is much sweeter, church. Amen. The destination is much more joyful, church. The destination is glorious. And when we get there, our footsteps will be combined with the footsteps of Jesus Christ. And he will be there with us forever and ever and ever and Amen. ever. Amen. Now to get there, we have to walk in obedience like Abraham did. We have to let our footsteps lead us towards him and allow our footsteps to show that path for others. Our footsteps tell the story. And we've examined Abraham's footsteps. Let's take a quick minute to look at Isaac's. Verses 7 and 8 here. Then Isaac spoke to his father, Abraham, and said, My father, and he replied, Here I am, my son. Isaac said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Then the two of them walked on together. Isaac asked his father, Dad, where, where's our sacrifice? Abraham said, Son, God will provide. And the two of them walked off. Isaac, in his 20s, once his father said, God will provide, Isaac knew, okay, I got it, Dad, God will provide. And he immediately set foot with his father. We see a beautiful scene here of a father and a son, a son who has learned about God, who has been taught about God, who has been brought up to trust God, a son, a son who knows and understands who God is. And this has been taught to him, and he knows this explicitly within his life. To Isaac, there was no question, no sacrifice, God will provide. Okay, Dad, off we go. There's no hesitation here. We have to disciple others like Abraham did Isaac. We have to teach the word, the truth to our children, our grandchildren, our neighbors, and our friends. We have to teach them to completely trust God with everything, to be obedient to him, to let their footsteps Amen. tell the story of a path of trusting him. Amen. The two of them walked to a place where the sacrifice was to be held. And, and let's look at verse 9 again. When they arrived at the place that God had told him about, Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood. He bound his son Isaac and placed him on the altar <coughs> on top of the wood. Now here's a picture of my son and I, my oldest son, Tyler. Um, he's, he's 23, Tyler is here, so he's probably a little bit younger than Isaac, Isaac is at this time. And I, I'm 45. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm getting old, but I'm not 125 years old like Abraham would have been, possibly around this time. Isaac, again, not the meek seven-year-old like we were taught in children's church. If, if Tyler did not want to be obedient and allow me to tie him to an altar to sacrifice him, I'd have a little struggle on my hand. My, my, my boy's a big kid, <laughs> right? I'd have a little struggle on my hand. Tyler's pretty strong. He's got youth on his side. I'm a little older, maybe not as agile as I was a few years ago. If he did not obey, it would be messy. <coughs> now, sir, I've got to say, I still win. But I'm just kidding. <laughs> Isaac, Isaac had been part of sacrifices before. He knew what they entailed. He knew exactly what was happening. He had watched his father prepare an altar before, maybe, maybe even helped him, or, or even maybe have, have prepared one on his own. He did not see an animal anywhere to sacrifice. He knew when he was being bound to the altar. Isaac knew he was being prepared as a sacrifice. There's no question. He walked up that mountain step by step along with his father, step by footstep. One in front of the other, knowing God would provide the sacrifice, hearing his father say that they would return together, and now he is willingly, without struggle, being tied to wood being bound, being set on the altar, and his father is brandishing the knife used for sacrifices. And he's either A, still trusting in God to provide a sacrifice, or B, accepting his fate as one needing to be sacrificed. There's no question. There's complete trust in the plan of God here. Isaac knew the promise God gave to his father. He knew the lineage of, his, of this nation was going to go through him. And still obediently, he's still lying there. What a story of trust and obedience those footsteps tell. At the last moment, we see the test is complete. Abraham and Isaac have been tested. An angel appears and, and stays the hand of Abraham still clutching the knife. Abraham has demonstrated faithfulness and he is justified at this point. Could you imagine faithful seconds away from sacrificing his son? Trusting God. 
And in verse 13, Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering in place of his own son. Y'all, my heart would be like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Could you imagine? In place of his son, the ram was sacrificed in place of his son. And here, in Genesis chapter 22, verse 13, we see the idea of a substitutionary sacrifice being introduced here. God providing, Jehovah Jireh, God provides, providing a substitutionary sacrifice. Amen. For, for Isaac, which will be culminated with the death of Jesus as a substitutionary sacrifice for us. Trust in him. God will provide. Amen. Verses 15 through 19 again. The angel of the Lord called Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn this is the Lord's declaration because you have done this thing and have not withheld your only son. I will indeed bless you and make your offspring as numerous as the stars of the sky and the sands of the seashore. Your offspring will possess the city gates of their enemies and all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And by your offspring, because you have obeyed my command. And at the end of this walk, at the end of this journey of faith, we see a formal reaffirmation of the Abrahamic covenant. The Lord affirms him in three separate elements. And he affirms him in his seed, he in 17. He affirms him in his land in verse 17. And he blesses him in verse 18. At the end of a journey trusting in God, the end of our footsteps will end in a restored promise. Trusting in God restores us. There is redemption in trusting in Him. Obediently walking where He leads ends in joy. Is marred by love and purpose is revealed. Church Abraham had no way of knowing what picture this painted. The foreshadowing of an event that would take place thousands of years later. Thousands of years later in a town called Bethlehem. Mary would give birth to a descendant of Abraham. God's own son. God's only son, Jesus. Amen. Jesus was born fully man and fully God, and he walked the earth and left a legacy of footsteps, footsteps that we would do very well to try to follow. Amen. It is these footsteps I want to talk about today, these footsteps of sacrifice. See, as God was testing the faith of Abraham and Isaac, he knew he would be sending Jesus, his only son, to earth for a similar reason. See, Jesus was sent from heaven to earth to be a substitutionary sacrifice for us. During his ministry on earth, it is believed that Jesus walked around 3,125 miles. That is roughly 6,600,000 steps. 6,600,000 steps, all leading to his sacrifice for us. Like Abraham knowing that each step would lead to that sacrifice, Jesus was arrested. He was tried in a farce of a trial. And after the trial, Mark 15 through 20 tells us, it tells us about the footsteps which tell the story of Jesus' sacrifice being led from Pontius Pilate to the prayer for him. And in verse 15 it says, Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate re released Barabbas to them. And after having Jesus flogged, he handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him. They twisted together a crown of thorns, and they set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him in the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. After this, Jesus carried his cross outside of Jerusalem through the Sheep Gate. The Sheep Gate is about 350 meters away from the Praetorium. Jesus carried his cross to Golgotha, the base of which is directly at the Sheep Gate. The Sheep Gate. Once they exited this gate, Simon carried his cross less than 40 meters up the steep the steep slope to Golgotha, the Mount Calvary. Ultimately, Jesus carried his cross for us for approximately 800 steps. 800 steps of mocking. 800 steps after being severely whipped to near death. 
800 steps after being struck repeatedly with a staff in the head and forced to wear a crown of thorns that cut into his head. 800 steps knowing that each one was for us. Amen. 800 steps falling closer to his death and to our redemption. Each step towards death and a step towards our freedom from sin. Each step closing a gap between us and our Father. 800 footsteps towards an eternity with us. 800 footsteps that tell a story of love, forgiveness, and absolute sacrifice, church. God sent his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. This morning, God is calling you to take steps. Your footsteps may be on a crooked path, uh, but, but Jesus didn't walk those 800 steps for you to stay on it. Maybe, maybe today, maybe today is, is, is the first step in trust and obedience down a path God has called you to. The first step's always the hardest. Maybe, maybe, maybe your, your, maybe your footsteps have led you down a path that you are ashamed about. Maybe they've led you down a path filled with mistakes, marred with sin, marred with whatever it may be. And maybe your footsteps have taken you to places you would never want to share with anybody else. But I promise you, Jesus has been with you every step of the way. Amen. And I promise you, no matter how, how depraved, no matter how wrong, no matter how, how dark, no matter how twisted, no matter what you have walked, Jesus has been there and he's saying, just take a step to the right. Just come back to me. I'm right here. Just take a step to a right. Just take it one more step and one more step. And if that's you today, guys, church, if that's you today, you need to make a step towards Jesus Christ, then, then you can do that by praying something like this. Dear God, I know that I've taken steps away from you. I know at times I may have run from you. God, I know that I may have run from a plan you had for me into, into brokenness. And God, I know that I'm in brokenness. And God, I ask that you forgive me for these things that I've done. I ask that you forgive me for the sins that I've done. I've asked you to forgive me. Please, God, forgive me for the mistakes that I've made that have kept me from having a right relationship with you. God, start me on the footsteps towards redemption. God, I believe that Jesus came down on earth as your only son and walked the earth. God, I believe that, that Jesus died and took that beating on the cross for me. God, and I believe that he died and he took all those sins on for me. And God, three days later, I believe that Jesus rose again. And God, make Jesus king of my life. Make him Lord of my life, God, and I surrender to him. And if you prayed that prayer this morning, I want you to come see one of us at the end so that we can talk to you about what next steps for you look like. But maybe today we just got to get back on the right track with God. Maybe that's not you. And we need to get back on the right track with God. And if that's so, come talk to one of our leaders here this morning so that we can, we can talk with you about that. We can pray with you about that. We can walk those steps with you. See, church, we don't walk steps alone. We walk steps together. Amen. Amen.